Tarp the Twitter feed. Now, we want to change gears. We want to take a look at uh, Libya. I'll have some, some uh, news reports about Libya, but we wanted to get a first-hand report from um, a very fine person that uh, I got to know in Libya. He, his visit there overlapped with mine, but he stayed on a bit longer and found himself caught up in the NATO attack, the NATO amphibious attack and uh, the entire NATO blitzkrieg against Tripoli, where he was at the time. So what we'd like to do is to get uh, from him a, a kind of a, an overview, a briefing that I think he's prepared, so we can just uh, just sail right through it, and I'll maybe ask a couple of questions at the end, but give him this entire uh, nine- or ten-minute segment. Uh, what was it like there, and, and what did we learn? What did he see firsthand in terms of the nature of this rebel al-Qaeda uh, conjuries? Uh, and he was, of course, in the Rixos Hotel at the point that that had become kind of the center of... Uh, world news uh, around the 20th to the 25th of, of August. And this is Darius Madi Nazem Roaya from, from Canada. So welcome, Madi. Thank you, Dr. Tarpley. Thank Are you, you there? Yes, I am, Dr. Tarpley. Can you hear me? Okay, so now you, you have the floor. You take it away and tell us, tell us the picture that you saw and the implications thereof. All right. Well, you described things as they were. It was, there was massive major NATO bombings, indiscriminate and merciless. This was one of the things they did to pave the way for the insurgents to come in. NATO forces were on the ground, and they were directing these forces. I spoke to people who were in combat and in the heat of battle, and they were telling me about French forces there, Qatari forces, Jordanian forces. They were on the ground. And let me tell you, there was British... Uh, individuals on the ground who were also directing these forces, and you could see them. In fact, in the rebel-held Corinthian Hotel, which was not secured at the time that I and other internationals were taken there from uh, the Rexos El, El, El Nasser, there was, the British were in charge of security there, and British intelligence was also there, amongst others, including the U.S. State Department. They were calling the shots there. In fact, the hotel that both you and myself stayed at, the Radisson, which I'm sure you remember, is run by the U.S. right now. It's being used as an interrogation base. And Khalifa Hefter, the CIA asset from Great Falls, Virginia, is based there, and that's his headquarters. And they've been interrogating people there and shooting them in cold blood in the rooms. I also oh. want to mention, mention that the insurgents were brought in through an amphibious assault after the merciless bombings, and there was also simultaneous helicopter attacks on the civilian checkpoints. The, they were manned by volunteers, militia, military, and police. The checkpoints were heavily attacked, not just in Tripoli, but in all the towns and cities west of Tripoli, on that highway between Jerba and Tripoli. Same thing with the Western Mountains, where U.S. Special Forces were on the ground. I can also tell you that the U.S., for over a month, was negotiating with the regime in Tripoli, the government in Tripoli, to free some Americans who were captured, servicemen, I believe, special forces who were captured, four individuals. And, and I can also add that on my way out from Tripoli, sailing through the Mediterranean Sea to the island state of Malta, there were three Italian individuals who were also caught. They were prisoners. They were mercenaries or Italian special forces, one or the other. And they were caught and... They were presented to myself and a whole uh, group of internationals from around the world, from places such as uh, Algeria, uh, the United States, and they, were, they presented them to us as tourists who had crossed the border from Tunisia, incidentally. But these tourists, so-called Italian tourists, had military equipment, and they also didn't have passports. They, they were registered without passports. I don't know how tourists can travel from Tunisia to Libya without passports with military equipment. And they were captured and they were on the boat with us. Uh, going back to the attacks on Tripoli, uh, the rebels were also fighting each other at the time. The so-called insurgents were even fighting each other. And, and there was witnesses to this. This is, was happening in the hotel. They did not secure the Corinthian. And there was, I was even told about the beheadings near the hotel. People were being beheaded. 
and now witch hunts, McCarthy style witch hunts, uh, more than McCarthy style, because uh, it's going beyond the borders of politi- uh, po- political uh, political um, intrigue. There's, they're going witch hunts like an inquisition, door to door, and they're taking people. So many people have been injured. The Red Cross, in fact, uh, if memory serves me correct, and I'm sure it has, said that 3,000 people died in two days, just two days. They've destroyed whole areas of Tripoli. It looks like Mogadishu or, or, or Kabul or, or, or Civil War Beirut. They've destroyed Tripoli uh, and the surrounding district. Whole, whole buildings have been turned into rubble, not just in Tripoli, and throughout Libya. And uh, I'm shocked that democracy now has actually said that there's no, uh, no destruction uh, to the infrastructure. That, that's not true at all. Even the CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation here in Canada, has shown towns that have been demolished. So I don't know where democracy now is getting its information from. There is no euphoria there. There's a state of fear. You know, the deputy foreign minister of Libya was arrested. And him, like many other people, they've been forced to say they've been there with the rebels the whole time. There's a state of fear, and people are silent in Tripoli because of this fear, and they're saying they're with the rebels. When that's not true at all, not true at all. A state of a blanket of fear has been imposed there, and the United States is calling the shots. It might be an American who's going to lead the transitional council and run Libya, just like how it was an American who who ran the provisional co- uh, coalition authority in, in Anglo-American occupied Iraq. So, so we, we can clearly see it, that it's the United States and NATO that, that control this country, and it's an imperialist war, and they want this war to last. I've been reading documents about how they're saying that the fighting in Libya is going to last for uh, several years. So they want another Somalia. They want another Afghanistan. They want the transitional council to be divided. They want fighting between uh, Gaddafi's side and uh, the rest of the country. And I want to add that... Dr. Musa Ibrahim, the official spokesman of the Libyan government, he's right now in Bani Walid fighting. He's fighting. And I, I want to say that I support this man. I had my differences with him. But he's fighting for his country. And, and, and this is what's going on. So many people have been forced to fight. They're not telling you in the media about Bani Walid. They're not telling you about the southern suburbs of Tripoli where there's fighting. They're not telling you about Sirte. They're not telling you about the attacks on black-skinned Libyans who are just as Libyan as anybody else. There's a lot of Black Panthers have moved to Libya because they find it a more equitable place than the United States. And uh, I, I want to point that out, and I want to point out that uh, black skin Libyans are being attacked. And the United States and the media, such as Al Jazeera and Al Arabiya and the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, all have a hand in this. And they had a lot of spies on the ground, Dr. Tarpley. Maybe uh, if our listeners uh, have any uh, influence over Amy Goodman, we should demand that, uh, that she let you on there on that Hypocrisy Now program, and uh, you could essentially deliver an antidote to the big lies that Amy has been, has been telling. I think she's probably getting some of it from the Ford Foundation. She seems to get a lot of things from the Ford Foundation. I'm, I'm shocked. I read, I read a, a transcript of the, of the things they were saying. It's untrue. The euphoria... Uh, the lack, saying that there's no uh, damage to the infrastructure is, is, is really, it's not correct, not correct at all. In fact, when I was there, I was correspondent for Pacific Radio, and Democracy Now! is on Pacific Radio, too. They were never speaking about Libya on Democracy Now!, only towards the end. And, the, and it was very short. You know, this is an important war, this NATO barbaric war of aggression NATO is waging against this North African country, but they never mentioned it, and only towards the end would they mention it, and they would mix it up with uh, the news about Syria, and they're saying the same thing about Syria. The Syrian, the Libyan model is being repeated in Syria, and it's going to be repeated in Algeria. Hang on one second, we'll just, we'll get a wrap-up, uh, we'll give you another couple of minutes after the break, okay? You can stay. Okay, sure. Welcome back to the Radio. We're just continuing, wrapping up our interview here with uh, Darius Mahdi um, Nazem Roaya of Canada, who was uh, essentially caught in Tripoli, Libya, by the NATO attack. And uh, and how you came out by boat to Malta? How did that go? Well, um, the the boat was delayed several times by the Transitional Council, and I think the U.S. Depart- State Department had a hand in it as well. Um, they were shuffling the list. They took people off. 
I can tell you that they arrested one Hungarian. Uh, they were, and I like to point out that these rebels are not just uh, targeting black-skinned Libyans. They're also uh, very racist towards Eastern European people, countries such as uh, Romania and, and Russia, and they're very racist towards Slavic people. They, they're very biased. Uh, like, it, um, you know, the populations in Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, Serbia, uh, Bosnia, they're very um, uh, pro-Gaddafi. Uh, because of this, there's a, there's a strong resentment against these countries. So you can see that they're being treated badly. Same thing with the Algerians. So, so this was very noticeable when we were being, uh, when we were being uh, taken out of Libya. And uh, the Russian embassy provided a bus for mo- many of the internationals to, uh, to arrive at the uh, harbor. And uh, w- our, our passports were, um, were processed by Transitional Council and the State Department had a hand, and I believe the British had a hand in processing it. So this really tells you who, who's uh, running the shots, uh, who's, who's, who's running the show there. Anyways, they, they took us there, and um, from there we had to sail. It was over 30-something hours on, on the, uh, in the Mediterranean, and we arrived in Malta. Um, it was a small vessel. We had to also unpack all the cargo inside of it ourselves so we could get, we could get out. And uh, th- that's essentially what happened. And while we were boarding the vessel, we saw Green Square, and we saw the fighting in Green Square and in Tripoli. So let me tell you, Tripoli has not totally fallen, and the Libyan government is still there. So the media here is trying to portray the, the Libyan government as a collapsed government, but that, that's not true. In fact, maybe you might see, uh, this is speculation on my part, you might see Colonel Gaddafi, uh, waiting a few months, and then they could take Tripoli back because people are starting to feel things are getting sour there, you know, and they're going to start fighting amongst themselves. The mood could really change, and everybody realizes that the situation there is very dyna- dynamic, it, and it's it's very volatile. So so don't rule anything out yet. You know, they're still fighting. They're still fighting in CERT, and, and they've cut off the water and the electricity and any f- supplies to the, it's all the cities that are resisting. There's a real Libyan resistance here, you know, and, and, and uh, they're, they're trying to starve them, just like they were doing to Tripoli. It was a siege over Tripoli. While they were bombarding, and they were bombarding civilian infrastructure, hospitals, universities, preschools, food storage facilities, everything you're, you're aware of, Dr. Tripoli, they were also completing the stranglehold around, uh, around Tripoli, and now they're doing it to these other cities. There's one city near Miserata, which is predominantly black-skinned Libyans, it's been turned into a ghost town. I don't see the news saying anything about it. They're really, they're really involved in perception management here. Okay. I'm, I'm, I, my, my reports are there's been a, a, a pro-Gaddafi counterattack near Asaba, killing 12 rebels, and in Ras a pro-Gaddafi counterattack, killing 15 rebels. So, uh, last question. What's the perspective of a prolonged uh, guerrilla war? Run by the Desert Fox, by Gaddafi the Desert Fox from uh, that vast area, thousands of kilometers in southern Libya. I think that we are going to see. We're going to see not only a prolonged war of resistance here against NATO occupation, but we're going to also see a prolonged uh, state of civil war. The Transitional Council fights each other. You know, there's that Islamic emirate in, in Darna. They're already sharing things. El Hajj, Sidi Hassadi. Yes, exactly. It, these people are, are fighting each other. They were fighting each other when I was in Tripoli in the Radisson, even even near the Corinthian. They're they're not a homogenous body. They are very very eclectic, and they fight each other, and they're going to fight each other for power. And when they attacked Banu Walid, there was a lot of a uh, lot of these divisions have showed, and I think the U.S. is going to play on those divisions too. So. We will see prolonged fighting because they don't control the West, and they definitely don't control Fizan in the South. They don't control Saba. And right now, I was told recently, just from a contact there, that in Saba they're trying to make uh, uh, negotiations so people can leave, humanitarian aid can come, but the media is not reporting anything about this. This is the real responsibility to protect the exposed. They don't care about any people's lives, just like those ships of migrant workers they left to die in the Mediterranean Sea. This is not about saving lives at all. This is about destroying a country that was a leader in Africa. Okay. 
We're going to have to leave it there, Bhakti, but we'll get you back in a couple of weeks for an update, okay, and see how things... <laughs>